Just a quick trigger warning before this week's episode starts. In this week's episode, there are some discussions around suicide. A lot of what you're doing is an attempt to feel safe. It is about them. I don't care if I never feel safe again as long as I keep them safe. Do you recognise that that's not a very healthy place to be? Yeah? What would happen if they, to you if they weren't safe? I failed. This is In Therapy with Alex Howard, a first-of-its-kind series that places you directly in the therapy room. My name is Alex Howard, and it is my hope that by bringing you on the journey with us, you too can learn the tools to transform your life. This series, we're following Haley, whose traumatic upbringing has resulted in severe depression and anxiety, as well as debilitating obsessive compulsive disorder. Haley has come to in therapy because she's decided enough is enough and wants to live the rest of her life free from the constraints of the past. Your inner sense of safety is dependent upon variables that are not under your control. And then you're finding ways to excuse behavior that I'm not sure that you should be excusing. I think it's probably killing me, to be quite honest. I mean, you don't have a horse track at 39 with no risk factors, really, do you? Join us each week as we follow every step of Haley's journey, both in and outside of the therapy room. As well as the tools I give Haley in the sessions, I'll also be sharing weekly top tips so you can begin to unlock your true potential. This is In Therapy. It's been about a week since Haley's first session. And my producers, Oliver and Jeremiah, are traveling up to visit Haley at home. The therapeutic process is not confined to just the therapy room. In fact, much of the progress happens in between the sessions. And it's our aim to try to capture that in the series. Okay. Number 14. Ah, it's this one right in front, I think. Yeah. Shadow just park in the driveway, so I will leave that one there. Okay. Let's get going. Too bad. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Can we come in? Yeah. It's a bit scruffy. I'm so sorry. I'm not well, at it's all. It's a bit smelly because we don't Ooh. really clean. I'm so. caught on your bush, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very rude. That's my smutty sense of humour. It, it's a bit smelly. Look, we have dogs and horses and we never clean. So it's smelly and. It's absolutely. It's smelly. Oh God, you should see my fat. Jeez. It's, it is smelly. We, we just don't clean. It's overrated, isn't it? Oliver and Jeremiah will be checking in with Haley throughout the process to find out how she's getting on. Obviously, in the session, we, you know, touched upon, um, sorry, Alex touched upon, you know, quite a few different points. We talked about um, people in your life that obviously um, are making things quite difficult. Yeah. How, how was talking about some of that stuff? Yeah, um, he, he, he's tough because it brings up a lot of stuff mm. um and um i i love very passionately um on an on an unbelievable level and no matter what somebody does to me i will keep loving and mm. it's it's really tough um it, it's just so much stuff for you it's just like a minefield isn't it mm. um i think for me in an ideal world i will be everything i can to those people in my life but there's a point where anything I get back from those people, I want to not take personally. Mm -hmm. So it is their issues, not something wrong with me. Because mm. so far, I've thought there really is something wrong with me. And so for the first time ever, you're thinking, 
there probably isn't something wrong with me. It's probably their stuff. So I'll continue to literally lay down my life for them because that's just what I'm here for. But at the same time, the stuff that is thrown at me has to bounce off me because it is destroying me and with my hand on my heart. So, you know, I thought about suicide a lot and I'm thinking, I can't, I'm here to do a job. And you can't get to that point because it's not fair for anybody to be at that point where you're dying for somebody. So I'll do whatever I can for anyone, but we, we did talk about putting these boundaries up and also learning that sometimes it's transference of their issues onto me and that I'm actually okay. And this is like new stuff for me. It doesn't occur to me that I'm okay. And it sounds really weird saying that, but we seem to have just got some rough relationships from a few different angles and no positive relationships. And so I think for me, I need to put some positive relationships in my life that build me up rather than tear me down. One of the impacts of childhood trauma is that we can become overly merged with and feel responsible for those around us. For Haley, I feel that learning to separate from her mum and create healthy boundaries is a critical step to liberating herself from the past and being free to create life on her own terms. Here's the session. What do you think... Because in a sense, what it strikes me is that a lot of what you're doing is an attempt to feel safe, right? For your nervous system to be able to relax and to be able to feel that you are safe, everyone around you is safe and everything is... It is about them. I don't know if it's about me. I think it's about them. Well, I think it's about them so you can then feel... Because ultimately, we're not talking about them. We're talking about your experience of them. And I think your experience of them is that uh, certain other people need to be at ease, okay, not in suffering or drama, and present, not 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 passing away or whatever, for you then to know that, that, that you feel safe. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost like you're in a sense of safety is dependent upon variables that are not under your control. Yeah, which is difficult because we need to feel safe. But the variables that need to happen for you to feel safe are not things that you, you can, can ultimately control. Um, okay, um, this is where the thing comes in. Yeah, um, but, but I historically make it me be in control of it by booking hospital appointments, checking my dad's had his tablets, checking my mum for mole cancers. So I have a part in that. So it- Yeah, well, I, yes, I, I think part of what happens is that there's a lot of anticipatory anxiety and a lot of energy that goes into all of these different things. And the kind of, I remember you said last time, the anxiety of if you cook something for someone and it makes them unwell, so not cooking, not preparing things for other people, all of these different variables and factors that go in. Yeah. But I think at the heart of all of that is that you trying to get to a place of inner safety. Yeah. And to keep them safe. What? We go together, we don't... What, what would happen if they to you if they weren't safe? I failed. That's what I'm now. And what would that mean? I, just, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't forgive myself. Is there something around your ability to be loved and to feel love is dependent upon you keeping everyone else safe? Yeah, it, um, it doesn't matter about me. It's about them. It doesn't matter what I feel. It's about them. As long as they know they're loved. Um, I don't really care what happens to me. I don't care if I never feel safe again as long as I keep them safe. Do you recognise that that's not a very healthy place to be, to not care about you, but to make how they are more important? Um, I would feel sad if I heard somebody else say that. And how about you saying it? 
Because I feel sad hearing you say that. I guess if, if I'm the best I can be, I can filter out and be nicer to them. But how about you being happy for you? I just, yeah, um, I just can't see it happening. I, could, I just look at the future and think, I'm just going to lose everything and I'm losing more of what I care about and stuff. It just feels really tough. We all have three core emotional needs. The need for boundaries, for safety and for love. Haley has learned that to feel safe, certain conditions for other people have to first be met, which results in a deep sense of the world not being a safe place. Haley has believed this for so long that it has become more than just a belief. Right now for her, this is the way the world is. Up until now, a lot of your happiness and your self-worth and your joy in life has been tied up in other people. But you're also here because you want things to be different. You know, you didn't come and sit in this chair to say, can you just make it all the same? And you're here because I think part of you knows that the way some, some of these things are set up right now is not, it's not good for you. And it's yeah. not making you happy. Yeah, yeah. I think it's probably killing me, to be quite honest. I mean, you don't have a horse track at 39 with no risk factors, really, do you? It just goes. Well, it's a, it, what I think is true is it, it's an enormous burden and stress on, on your physical body and on your emotional body and on your mental body. Mm. Mm. As I say, my point is not that you shouldn't love and care for people in your life and, and want what's best for them and and do what you're able to to help facilitate that but it's that your sense of self-worth and happiness and joy is not linked it's not hooked to that but if someone in your family was ill mm -hmm. well... depends who it was and it depended on what i could and couldn't do if it was one of my children then I would do anything in my power to be able to help them. If it was certain family members that I have more complex history with, where perhaps there's been some forms of abuse or there's been some form of, of damage in the relationship and I might not be in contact with them or I may not be in close contact, then I would probably feel heaviness in my heart and feel some sadness, but I wouldn't feel a responsibility to rescue and to help them. There are other people in my life where I'm in relationship with them and I love them and I, and I care about them and I would do what I could that I felt was appropriate but I would also see it as their journey for them to be on. Yeah. And so I wouldn't feel ultimately responsible for the outcome yeah. and I wouldn't feel responsible for the choices and the decisions and, and the day-to-day. -day. Yeah. Does, does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah. But there's a part of you so linked with those you love the most. And sure. when they go through stuff, it's really hard to separate yourself, it is. isn't it? It is really hard. And particularly when there's histories of trauma and histories of abuse where we have been taught that we have to be merged with those people. Right, okay. But part of what I'm challenging with you is... Just because things have been a certain way historically doesn't mean that that's the healthiest way for them to be going forward. Okay, yeah. Another way to think about it is we can have codependent relationships yeah. where we end up enmeshed and merged with people and our self-value becomes tied to what we do for that person that isn't healthy okay because we ultimately can't rescue and do th everyone has to as adults has to be responsible for, for their own journey and if somebody has severe mental health issues for example take an extreme example we can't be responsible for being that person's carer and therapist and all of those things. We may try to help put some things in place and we and we we might 
try to support certain things, but there needs to be a clear separation. And I think part of your difficulty is that separation is not it's not happened in the way that it needs to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a overinflated sense of responsibility for every single yeah. person on uh, animal animals as well. Yeah. Just every, uh, I am God basically, <laughs> and it's really tiring. You know, when you're trying to save everybody. Well, even God gets one day off. I know it's rubbish. It? <laughs> like, yeah. That's like you, so you're not be taking the Sundays. Yeah, I've not been taking them, but it does feel like you're trying to be God for everyone. It's yeah. just like. And it's, so, what do you think is? driving that need to be responsible for everyone else because i just i just thought that's what we did mm. it didn't occur to me that that's not what everybody does yeah and as we talk about it now what because we're, we're, we're putting a bit of a spotlight on that idea i wonder what you think as we talk about it it's the, it's new. <laughs> it's just I, 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 it doesn't. Everybody do that. No, no, really. That's weird. I suppose I'm right. And you're wrong. I mean, you might be. <laughs> yeah, you, you might be. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's it's possible to help other people, to genuinely care about other people, and not feel responsible for other people. And I think what's happened for you is your caring and love has become fused with an unhealthy sense of responsibility. So like in this moment, I, I feel kindness towards you. I feel a, a, a strong desire to help and to bring the best of my, my skills and my attention and my, and my thoughts to, to, to this process. And I feel responsible in a professional capacity to make sure that my duty of care has been suitably put in place and you know, that, that, that those pieces are, are, are there. But I don't feel responsible for your choices that, that, you, that you make in life. And I don't feel responsible for your happiness. But if your daughter was sat here? I think, so I also don't feel responsible for my children's happiness. I feel responsible for being a good father and I feel responsible for showing up in, in the way a, a, a good father would. And that level of responsibility for them should naturally decline as they age. So when they're babies, of course, one is one's completely responsible. But it's very unhealthy as a parent to not relinquish responsibility as children, as children age. Because otherwise what happens is you're manipulating or you're smothering or you're controlling and you're stifling your growth and they're just going to bat you away even further. So one of the challenges of, of being a parent is to, to feel what is the appropriate level of influence and, and um, direction of, of this child and to feel when it's safe to gradually step that back and remove that to allow the child to, to flourish. And that also means at times in there, and we're not quite there yet but my other side is only about 10 11 but we're going to get there where they're going to increasingly make choices that i might not like they may choose people they want to be in an intimate relationship with or they want to be friends with or they may choose paths they want to go down and my job is to try and give them the best values that i can to give them as much love as i can but also to really respect their own sovereignty and their own independence and to to allow them to become themselves Anything different to that is going to cause them suffering and, and pain that I, I don't want to do. Yeah. What I think you're struggling with is you are feeling a sense of responsibility in places that you cannot and should not be responsible. Okay. Well, how, how, does it, how does that land with you? Um, it's, it's going to take some thought. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel a sort of a hopelessness that I can't change. I'll see it. And is it right for change? I'll see it. Is it is it right? I hear what you're saying, but it's like, is it is that right? Is that right? You know, there's a bit of uncertainty. I'd have to think about. It. Well, it's a big thing, right? Because in a sense, this some of these relationships with certain people in your life have, in a sense, been the fabric, like the underpinning. Uh, the foundation is probably a better word, but a metaphor, like the foundation of much of what your life has been built upon. Yeah. The problem is it's come at great price. Yeah. 
it's come at a physical price and it's come at an emotional price. And what I'm challenging is, does it need to be that way going forwards? Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, it not being that way going forwards is initially going to be unsettling and scary and, and it doesn't all need to change overnight. Today is not even about trying to change the relationship. What we're talking about at the moment is just understanding the way it's currently set up and the price you're paying for that. Yeah. Okay. So a bit of sort of saying, okay, this, this isn't all my responsibility. Just do the best you can. It cannot be your responsibility because these people will make their own choices anyway. It's not like they do everything you say, right? <laughs> if they did, it might be better. <laughs> but the fact is that they don't. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the reason why it, it's so stressful is that it's you can't control what they do. But the way it's set up at the moment, what they do is controlling how you feel. So the problem you've got is that your feelings and emotions are tied to something outside of your control. So you aren't able to have emotional stability and equilibrium because it is dependent upon actions of others that you can't control. Yeah. Yeah. And that is inherently stressful. Yeah. Yeah, because even if you remove that, there's nothing else. I feel like I've lost everything else that matters anyway. Yeah. Is that true, though? Um, I know that's how it might feel, but I'm just wondering if that's actually true. Yeah, um, it feels like that right now because I can't play badminton, I can't play around, I just can't do netball, I've finished college, I've lost all the people I went to college with, it does. But, um, so let me ask you a question. What do you want? Like what would bring you, what are the things that historically have brought you real joy? And you've spoken some of these things to me already. Sport is something that's brought you joy. You mentioned to me last time that doing the counseling training and some of the bonds that you'd made with some of the other students on there, that had been something that had really given you something. What, what else do you notice really makes, makes you feel happy? Yeah, it is, it is just those things. Yeah, I really like animals, but I have to be really careful there because um, the closest I ever came to suicide was when I lost my dogs and my horse. Mm. So I have to be really careful. I really like animals, but uh, I, I can't go there again. <laughs> I'm kind of, you know. Um, I like all my friends, are, all the people from college are saying I should do the next level counselling, like level three. Mm. Not not to be a counsellor because I've got too much stuff, <laughs> but just for the training because yeah. you can use it in everyday life. Totally. I think that's a great idea. Um, so I could do the like level three if if I pass level two, do my exam. So, but it, but I mean it's that's tied in with confidence levels. Um, what what I'm hearing you say is that having community with people, and I think that's something you've not had enough of over your over your life. And so that that being around others and kind of feeling part of something I think is important. 100%. Like when when these guys came to my house, I didn't want them to go because it's so nice to see. Them. Yeah. I was like, you know, and there's that emptiness when they're gone. And it's not it how is. I feel towards them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I can't like, get rid of them, you know? Yeah, no, I was going to lock them in. But yeah, it is other people. And yeah. it's like, if you look at my life, I've had no other people around me that have been positive. And I, think, and I think part of the challenge is that because of the things that you've struggled with, the way you've dealt with that is often by becoming more isolated. So before you, after the heart attack, before you ran the marathons and you were agoraphobic for a while, my sense is actually you pushed more and more of the world away. But the problem is that actually what you really need is to come more into the world and have a sense of belonging and having a sense of community and having a sense of enjoying, just, you know, interacting with and, and being with people. As mentioned earlier, we all have a need for boundaries, safety and for love. With Haley having normalized to being isolated, I feel strongly that bringing more love and connection into her life is critical to building a future free from the traumas of the past. It is a human need to feel connected. Absolutely. And I, and I, and I think it, it's a really important piece. And, and you know what I'm hearing is that you want your you enjoy having your mind challenged you enjoy moving your body 
and you enjoy feeling in community and feeling connected to, to other people, they sound like really good things to want, like healthy things that, 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 that make sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. If you had more of those in, in your life, how would that be, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, because I think I'm really afraid of loneliness. Yeah. Because um, I was lying in, in the bath a few weeks ago. Um, I was thinking, I could just drown myself now. Just, and I could hear... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I could hear one of my friends from college in my head say, don't you dare come to pull you out. And it was it was their voices. Yeah. There was nobody else's voices. The other voices were saying, let me hold you down. <laughs> I put my foot on your head. But it was the guys from college saying, no chance I'm coming to get you. And it is that difference. It feels like some people were like, oh, I'll, I'll help and hold you under. And some people saying, I could pull you out because you mean too much to us. And, it and, you, and you need more of those people. How does it feel to talk about it? Yeah, um, it's heavy. It hurts. People just do the best they can, really. Yes, but that doesn't excuse behaviour. You know, it's like people do do the best they can, but we could also say that of rapists and murderers and terrorists and it, it doesn't, there still have to be boundaries and edges of appropriateness and inappropriateness and okayness and not okayness. And just because someone might be struggling and do the best they can, but that doesn't mean that that behavior is, is, is tolerated or accepted. And I think part of the challenge here is that because your sense of safety and your sense of kind of joy and, and, and love in your life is tied to certain people that are behaving in complex and, and, and damaging ways, you're feeling responsible for that. And then you're finding ways to excuse behavior that I'm not sure that you should be excusing. How does it feel as we talk about it? Um, I have to sit and see how stuff sits in a felt sense, which is what you always say. <laughs> um, yeah, it is, it's, it's a different way of looking at everything, isn't it? And it's a big challenge when you've looked at something for so long in a certain way. In terms of the lying in the bath and having the thoughts and feelings you are having, is that something that's happening often? Or is that something that happens from time to time or something that doesn't really happen? Um, it probably happens more often than I'm prepared to admit, really, yeah. Um, but my, my job, I've got a job for a while while my parents are here and then I'm like, my job's gone then. But you know what, I have a tenacity in me that doesn't give up. So I'm saying on the one hand, I'm kind of done, but there's a part of me that doesn't give up. And so there's a part of me that, and I wish it wasn't there, but it is. Um, and so it will, you know, I, w I won't do anything, I won't end my life or anything because there's too much tenacity in me and it's, it's just such a sad waste if, if you go down that path. It is. It is a waste. It's so sad. And when you find yourself having those thoughts, how, how do you support yourself? Yeah, um, yeah. I've, I think about people that have been nice to me, people that have helped me and, and yeah, that really. Mm. And does it ever go into active planning or it just, it just, you kind of have the thought and then you go through the process and then you move forward? Yeah, um, like I've got, there's quite a history of suicide in my family. Um, I, won't, I, won't, I won't do it. There's no worry about that whatsoever because I've seen people when I had a heart attack fight for my life. Yeah. I'm not going to insult them by me doing it. That's yeah. not fair because they thought I was worth it. I think all the people are worth it and therefore I have to say that I'm worth fighting for because people are, and it's so sad to lose people. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I, so I won't do it. There's no plan in my mind, okay, right. but it is a flash thought. I get it, and it's a, um, a, a symptom, of one, one of a better word, of, of how, you, how low you're feeling, yeah. I think, sometimes. Yeah. You know, and I think it goes back to 
this issue that we're talking about today of your joy and your happiness being tied to other people yeah. and this this issue around this over responsibility for everybody else yeah. Yeah. and what i would what i'm hoping to, that we that we can help with is moving the boundaries to a um, a healthier for you and actually a better for everyone else place in terms of what you are and what you aren't responsible for. Part of Haley's homework has been to grow her awareness around her unhelpful patterns of thinking and behavior. A resource we're using to help with this is my 12-week online coaching program, The Reset Program. The Reset Program is not just a program to build awareness and understanding of the impacts of the past and how they shape what's happening in our nervous system now, but more importantly, to learn practical tools and techniques to be able to learn to reset your nervous system in the present now but also to unlock your true potential in the future. Haley has been working through the first few modules and she's now working on module four. Module four teaches a process called the stop process. Stop process is derived from elements of NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, along with principles from hypnotherapy, from mindfulness, and also from CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Really, the key with the stop process is building awareness of the unhelpful patterns that are happening, then having a way to stop, to interrupt those patterns and shift our attention and our awareness to become more fully in our body, in the present, in the moment, and not in the consistent old pattern that pulls us in an unhelpful old direction. If you'd like to find out more about the Reset program, you can watch a free three-part video series at reset.alexhoward.com. Here's how Haley has been working with the stop process. What did you find yourself using the stop process on? What were some of the thoughts and patterns that you were working with? Um, so the two that were the best were if someone was unkind to me, um, I would stop that. Uh, stop the ruminating over that and stop the self-blame over that. So it's like, so say somebody says something nasty to me, I was like, no, stop. This is their stop. So I stopped and said, uh, normally I'd worry about it, get upset about it, cry about it, be miserable all day. But I was like, stop. This is their stuff. It's not reflective of who I am as a person. This is their stuff. I'm not going to take it on board. I'm going to leave it there and start yeah. paying mental tennis yeah. with it. And, and, and how effective did you find that? Yeah, it was surprisingly effective, yeah. actually surprisingly good for not taking on board stuff that has been thrown at me that isn't mine yeah yeah is that a good answer yeah that, that's what i'm after <laughs> yeah that's it was good it was yeah. good yeah not so successful in anticipatory anxiety okay um i recognize it was anticipatory anxiety i told myself that me rehearsing it in my head felt like i was going through it already and it was useless yeah. so i went through an intellectual process which i know you wanted me tap into my body didn't you but i went through just persuading myself why it was safe to let it go yeah and it's going to take some time anticipatory anxiety is can you give me some and it's okay if you don't remember but i wonder if you can remember any examples of the anti where you used it on anticipatory anxiety, like what what you were anticipating, like what what the situation was. Yeah, um, she, she it was um, my mum going to hospital. Yeah, and and running different scenarios of what might happen and what if this and what if that. If you got COVID, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so you used the stop on that, and it didn't feel so effective in that instance. Um, no, it felt like I had to run with the rumination because I might be able to problem solve in that process. Okay, that's great. So that's that's what I was looking for. So it sounds like that there's uh, really what the pattern is that about needing to think your way to a feeling of safety. So what I mean by that is if I think through all the different scenarios, well, if this happens, I could do that. Oh, but that might happen. And, th and it's almost like having a very, very thorough kind of uh, search of all the different scenarios yeah. to then go, okay, I've run through all the different scenarios. 
I can now feel a bit more so, oh, but hang on, there's that one as well. Oh, because it's almost like a never ending yeah. list, right? Yeah. Of, thing, of things that might happen. So, of course, the difficulty with that is if that feeling of safety that we're after is so dependent on all of those different scenarios, then it's very difficult to get that feeling of safety. Yeah. But um, you have minimised your risk of letting somebody down and failing by getting through all those scenarios. Well, what I would say is there's a point where there is a, to put it in a different context, there's a healthy risk assessment to do. Yeah. And there's a point where you've done that now and now you're actually just aggravating your nervous yeah. system. Yeah. So it's not the, you know, for example, taking, taking the example of your mum going to hospital, it is a good idea to think about, well, how long should she be in there for? How can we try to make sure she gets what she needs? Have they been given the full information? Like, that, that, that's, that is appropriate. I'm not saying to stop thinking about things. But it's recognizing the point that that thinking has gone from being constructive to now just running it to running a pattern. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we actually assess risk much more effectively when our nervous system is calm. 100%. And so the, the belief at the moment is I need to be in this maladaptive stress response to be able to read all the dangers to be safe. And I guess what I'm what I'm suggesting is actually the calmer you are, the more accurately you'll be able to assess the situation. Yeah. What, what, what do you think about that? No, yeah, it's good. To, I read it and it made sense and it, straight away I was like, yeah, 100%. Yeah, there's a point where you do it for a little bit and then it's like, okay, this is no longer useful. It's just winding me up. Yeah. Yeah, I read it and it 100% made sense. So two key things I want to summarize for you to, to reflect on and, to, and to, to work with. The first is this point around your responsibility for other people and this sense of this, your joy and your uh, happiness in life being tied to things that you actually can't really control. Okay. And this idea of moving those boundaries effectively. So that's the first piece, I want you, and, and, I, and I want you just to have some time to reflect on that and, and sit with that. The second thing is to continue what you're doing with using the stop process. The more you use it, the more effective, you, you know, the more places that you can have some effect. Go to module five as well. In fact, go to module five and module six between now and next time. So module five will deepen your work with the stop process and then module six will start to look at how you're relating to and responding to your feelings and, and your emotions, which I think is a kind of next next piece in this. Um, I will summarize it to you in an email later as well. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. all my words gone it's Okay, don't worry about it. I'm done now. Yeah, you know, you're cooked. I'm cooked. What, 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 what we technically refer to as cooked. Done, <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any questions for me? No, um, no, it's just really nice to see you. Thank you so much. I was thinking when my knee went, I was thinking, oh, I'm done. I'm, you know, and I was thinking, no, no, I've got Alex, so thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's just the fact that somebody, somebody else in your life actually thinks you waste an effort a, a try somebody's try i've used my words you know what i mean yeah well i know you're worth an effort but my job is to help you realize that you're worth an effort okay thank you you're welcome welcome therapy is not just about what happens in the therapy room it's about what happens in our everyday lives a key part of my work with clients is setting homework to help them deepen their understanding of what we are exploring together and practicing the tools and techniques which will help drive change. Continue to follow Haley's journey over the coming weeks as we release weekly episodes of her sessions with me. You can watch here on YouTube or listen to the podcast to help support you in coming on the journey with us. I've created some materials to accompany the series. Each week there is a bonus video with me and a worksheet to bring the session to life for you. 
In this week's Reflections, you can reflect on how well you've learned to meet your three core emotional needs. You can find these resources for free at intherapy.alexhoward.com. Here's what's coming up next week. You're a gutsy person. And if I didn't see it, I wouldn't say it. It's nobody ever said that before. <laughs> I think I was stupid, but thank you for saying I was gutsy. What I think ultimately isn't important. What's important is what you think. And our job together is to help you see yourself as objectively and as accurately as possible. So if you reframe how I see myself, I might have to entertain the idea that I could do something once and get it right. 